Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Russ Van Geldner. He's a <clears throat> professor and chair of the University of Washington Medicine Department of Ophthalmology and director of the Roger and Angie Corrales Johnson Retina Center. He's also director of the University of uh, Washington Vision Science Center. And he's an ophthalmologist and has done a lot of research over the years on various aspects of eye disorders, both basic and, and clinical research. So welcome, Russ. Great. Thank you for having me, Mark. Uh, pleasure to be here. And you, um, so you, did, you, you started out, your undergraduate was in biological sciences at Stanford. Is that right? That is correct. Long time ago. And you were in like a pre-med track early on? I, I was. I uh, uh, did did a, a fair amount of research as an undergraduate, um, mostly in the Stanford Sleep Lab, and I kind of got my uh, got my feet wet in uh, <clears throat> biomedical research, studying sleep and then circadian rhythms, which is what I did my PhD work on, uh, ultimately in Drosophila. Ah, interesting. And what what was kind of your main findings from your PhD work? You know, this was in the uh, uh, late 80s and early 90s. And at, at that time, uh, it was known that the circadian clock had a genetic basis. Um, and several genes had been identified, most most notably the period gene in, in Drosophila. But how this gene actually gave rise to a self-sustained circadian clock was not at all clear uh, from just the sequence of the gene. Um, the... Uh, mystery was really uh, cracked primarily by the team of uh, Paul Harden, Jeff Hall, and Mike Rosebash. And Hall and Rosebash ultimately won a Nobel for, for this work, um, showing that the period gene uh, uh, was involved in a time-delayed transcription translation feedback loop in Drosophila. And it was actually this uh, self-sustained uh, oscillator that was caused by negative repression of the period gene on its own own expression that set up the basis of, of circadian timekeeping. And my, my thesis work was to identify other genes that were affected by that loop in Drosophila. And so I did a very large, for the time, a very large scale screen for um, genes that were subject to circadian regulation in the heads of Drosophila and the dependency of their oscillation on the period gene. Um, uh, this uh, uh, really took us to some of the precursors of um, uh, gene expression profiling and uh, microarray profiling and things like that before those techniques were were actually things uh, uh, back in the 80s. But uh, th that's where I really got my start in biomedical research. Yeah, and the, the, the genetic manipulations that can be done in the flies, it's really kind of greatly accelerates what you can understand about basic biology, and in this case, circadian rhythms. Yeah, absolutely. The fly was the perfect uh, system for studying this at that time, particularly. This was, of course, long before any uh, organism's genome had been sequenced or uh, before we really had even access to what the whole transcriptome looked like. Um, uh, but we did have pretty thorough genetic data in Drosophila, and so we knew where many, many genes were mapped um, across the whole fly. And of course, flies are uh, uh, easily uh, manipulable um, uh, organisms in the lab, so it was fairly easy to, uh, you know, grow up sixty thousand flies in a week and and uh, collect tissue from them at different circadian times and extract RNA and other things that are more challenging in a mammal uh, or a larger larger organism. Okay, so you were in the MD PhD program there at Stanford, I guess. And, Correct. And then for your residency, you decided to go to a different kind of the what would you call it inverse Washington <laughs> University yeah. in in Saint of where you are now, Washington yep, University. It, yeah, exactly right. Uh, WashU, I did my residency and stayed there for my fellowship uh, in uh, ocular inflammatory disease and medical retina disease. And then I stayed at WashU for another eight years after uh, I finished uh, residency and fellowship uh, on faculty, and and sort of had my uh, went went through my junior uh, faculty stages uh, at WashU, which was a wonderful 
environment for uh, uh, for any faculty member, but particularly as a junior faculty member. Uh, that department was a very exciting place uh, in the uh, in the early and mid nineties. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> okay, and then so did you start working on eye infections then, and and that kind of was one of your first areas of yeah. Focus. My lab has has always had uh, several um, several areas of interest, and and we've kept going in the circadian space for a long time. And we still work uh, on aspects of circadian, um, particularly synchronization. Uh, and one chunk of my lab has been uh, pretty thoroughly devoted to understanding opsin molecules that don't mediate light uh, uh, for vision, but mediate light sensing yeah. for circadian rhythms and other functions like wound healing. And these are opsins like melanopsin, neuropsin, and cephalopsin. And we, we've published quite a few papers in that in that domain. Um, as a resident, my chair at the time, Hank Kaplan, um, was interested in, in the emerging field of molecular diagnostics. And uh, this is basically using molecular biologic techniques to detect infections, particularly PCR-based amplification techniques. Mm -hmm. And when I was a resident in the mid-90s, these were still pretty new techniques. Uh, I think the... the uh, Carrie Mullis PCR paper came out, the, the sort of uh, final form of PCR in 88. So uh, it was less than a decade old as a technique when I was a resident. Um, but I was quite familiar with it from my graduate work. And, and uh, Dr. Kaplan had asked me if I could help set up a laboratory to do that at WashU for patients with uh, occult infections like herpes, ocular, intraocular infections, and, and bacterial endophthalmitis and so forth. And it was fairly straightforward to do that. So I, I got sort of started on that track at that point in my career. And again, it's something that we've just carried through now. Uh, you know, it's uh, 28 years, I think, since I started uh, my 29 years this year since I started residency. Uh, but we're still working on uh, improving molecular diagnostic techniques for rapid detection of ocular infection. So that's been a very translational part of the lab. And then the third part of the lab, which is, I think, the part that... Uh, uh, we're going to discuss most today has been our work in trying to do vision restoration. And this really came out of uh, the non-visual opsin work. We had a toolbox, which I think we'll get into a little bit uh, in the podcast, allowing us to study the retina in ways that were not widely adopted at that point, but turned out to be very useful for assessing certain types of vision restoration technologies. Okay, so then as a prelude to that, could you kind of just summarize what are some of the major causes of blindness and and what what cells in the visual pathway are most affected in each? And then and then also, um, you know, I guess you can within that talk about genetic, you know, uh, blindness caused mm -hmm. by mutations and then acquired, I guess, blindness. Sure, absolutely, Mark. So uh, blindness is still unfortunately quite common in our society worldwide. Uh, estimates are somewhere between 0.1 and 1% of the population is visually impaired, and it's a major cause of, uh, of, of quality-adjusted uh, uh, life years of disability uh, uh, worldwide. I think uh, uh, two of the major causes of uh, blindness in the world are in the top 20 for total disability that's uh, uh, engendered by them. So th these remain very serious problems, uh, uh, even in the 21st century. Um, it, the causes of blindness in the world are a bit different depending on where you are. Uh, in parts of the world where access to medical care is not um, superb, cataracts are still a major cause of blindness. So mm -hmm. if you go to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in, in uh, uh, places and uh, in parts of Asia, uh, there's still quite a few people whose vision is is uh, seriously impaired by cataract, which you'll rarely see in the U.S. or, or Western Europe. Um, in, in the U.S. and in Western Europe, the three leading causes of uh, uh, visual disability and blindness are uh, age-related macular degeneration, um, glaucoma, and uh, diabetic retinopathy. Uh, in the US, uh, age-related macular degeneration is the leading cause of, um, of blindness and, and visual disability. 
The retina is a remarkable uh, trilaminar tissue. Its total thickness is about the thickness of a piece of Kleenex. Uh, but within that, that thickness, there are three different cell layers that, that serve different functions. The most numerous cells in the retina are the photoreceptors. Uh, we have about 100 million of those in our uh, adult human retina. And those are the rods and the cones whose job is to absorb photons of light, uh, which uh, are absorbed by the chromophore uh, retinaldehyde within a, a protein, an opsin. And uh, for the visual system, we have four opsins, humans do, uh, most humans do, um, which are the uh, blue, green, and red cone opsins, the three color cone opsins, and then rhodopsin, which is uh, a more sensitive um, uh, opsin that, that we primarily use under very dim light conditions. And the cones express the color opsins, the rods express uh, rhodopsin. In hereditary macular, I mean, in uh, acquired age-related macular degeneration, uh, for reasons we don't fully understand, uh, the photoreceptors, the, the rods and cones uh, break down, particularly right in the center of vision in the uh, macula, uh, and in the uh, fovea, um, and you have age-related death of those photoreceptors along with their sort of nourishing layer, the retinal pigment epithelium. Um, the remarkable thing about that disease is that uh, although the photoreceptors uh, degenerate, which yields visual disability and blindness in severe cases, um, the rest of the retina is left intact. And so the other two layers of the uh, retina are a processing layer made up mostly of bipolar cells that synapse with both the photoreceptors and the downstream uh, ganglion cells, and then the retinal ganglion cells themselves. And the ganglion cells are the cells whose axons make up the optic nerve. And that's how information exits the, the eye and gets to the brain. Those uh, uh, axons desiccate at the optic chiasm and end up in the thalamus where they then relay onto the cortex. So when we think about age-related macular degeneration, the fundamental problem is that the photoreceptors have disappeared but the rest of the retina is still intact and capable of signaling. Glaucoma is a different disease. In glaucoma, uh, the optic nerve dies. And again, we don't really understand the pathophysiology fully. We know that elevated eye pressure is, is a uh, major risk factor and a, uh, can cause uh, death of the ganglion cells, but it's not the whole story because there are patients who can have elevated pressure for years and have no damage to their optic nerve. And there's other people who's optic nerve degenerates even at, at what we would consider normal intraocular pressure. Um, vision restoration for uh, people with, with glaucoma is going to be more challenging because you've lost the link between the eye and the brain. Uh, in some way, that's going to require either bypassing the eyes completely, that is some sort of cortical stimulatory device, or regrowing an optic nerve in some way. And those are uh, there are uh, promising results in that domain. But at this point, no one has really succeeded in, in de novo regenerating an optic nerve and uh, uh, allowing a uh, glaucoma eye to communicate with the brain again. Diabetic retinopathy is um, a little bit more of a hodgepodge. There's a lot of pathophysiology going on in, in diabetes, which includes neovascularization of the retina, um, uh, macular edema, and, and so forth. Uh, typically, the photoreceptors don't die in as great numbers in um, diabetic retinopathy, and usually when there's vision loss from diabetes, it's a secondary complication of the diabetes rather than direct injury to the retina from the diabetes. For example, retinal detachment uh, occurs frequently in patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Um, that's a, a condition that also could theoretically be uh, corrected with an appropriate vision restor uh, restoring technique although a bit more challenging because the anatomy of the uh, retina is disturbed by the, by the detachment. Um, so those are the major uh, acquired causes of blindness. In the congenital realm, uh, the most common uh, inherited causes of blindness fall in, in the uh, what we call uh, under the umbrella inherited retinal degeneration or IRDs. And uh, many of those fall into the retinitis pigmentosa family. And these are diseases that generally show up in, in childhood or, or adolescence uh, and feature uh, essentially genetically programmed degeneration of the photoreceptors primarily. Um, this is uh, again, quite common worldwide, about one in 3000 people uh, around the world has hereditary retinal degeneration, some sort of uh, IRD. Um, 
in the last three decades, uh, the um, knowledge of what causes in, uh, inherited retinal degeneration has really burgeoned. We know of um, mutations in at least 100 different genes that can cause hereditary degeneration and thousands of individual mutations. Um, we recognize many flavors now of uh, inherited retinal uh, degeneration. It's not all just one big, you know, retinized pigmentosa. Um, and there is potential for doing gene therapy to correct certain forms. And in fact, one of the major milestones, I think, in the 21st century of medicine in general, not just uh, vision science, was the uh, uh, successful uh, correction of the RPE65 mutation, which is an, uh, uh, a uh, uh, isomerase, it's a retinol isomerase, um, which... Uh, can be corrected by adenoviral uh, uh, associated AAV uh, gene therapy. And there is actually an FDA approved product, uh, Lexterna, uh, which passed clinical trial uh, and uh, clearly shows benefit for children who have uh, uh, the disease caused by that mutation, which is called Leber's congenital amaurosis. Um, so there, there is definitely progress uh, happening in that space. Um, and and so, for, so for that particular uh, approach, are they knocking out the gene or are they putting a good uh, functional gene in? Yeah, Mark, it's a gene replacement therapy. So the, okay. the um, Leber's amaurosis is also caused by several different gene mutations. Um, the group, there were two groups actually at University of Pennsylvania that uh, pushed this gene therapy forward with colleagues around the country um, and both settled on an adeno-associated uh, virus, AAV, replacement therapy, putting the RPE65 gene into that, that vector and then injecting that subretinally underneath the retina where it could infect the retinal pigment epithelium specifically, which would cause it then to again start synthesizing this gene. Uh, and uh, that uh, actually restored visual function to kids who got the, uh, the treatment in the clinical trial. Uh, it was really one of the very first examples of successful gene therapy in any field it was the first neural uh, gene therapy uh, uh, that had been uh, attempted, and it's still one of a very small handful of FDA-approved uh, gene therapy. Um, realistically, it was much more of a proof of concept than something that's going to have a huge public health implication. There's uh, on the order of a couple hundred kids in the United States with this particular mutation who would benefit from it, but certainly opened the door, and there are at least a dozen uh, gene therapy trials in various stages right now uh, nationally for other hereditary retinal degenerative diseases. Okay, and then talk about other approaches like uh, cell replacement. So in age-related macular degeneration, the photoreceptors are degenerating. Um, then you've got these retinal pigment cells mm -hmm. that have problems in some. So one approach is to like generate those cells somehow or transplant in precursors like stem cells that will then replace them. So what's going on there in both preclinical and I guess it's mostly preclinical, but. Yeah, it is mostly preclinical. So the idea of doing cell type transplantation um, uh, in the eye actually goes back over 30 years and several groups in the 1990s tried transplanting fetal retinal pigment epithelium uh, into uh, uh, into eyes with advanced uh, macular degeneration. The results were not particularly favorable uh, for a number of reasons. One of them was the RPE is not really a uh, uh, immunologically privileged space. And so uh, in doing these transplants, uh, one had to immunosuppress the patients the same mm -hmm. as if they'd gotten a liver transplant. Um, uh, the second is that the anatomy of the uh, replacement is challenging. Um, the RPE, the pigment epithelium mm -hmm. is a monolayer. It's an extremely thin layer. Uh, when you harvest it, it has a tendency to scroll up or roll up on itself. Very hard to physically transplant that. So um, I think interest uh, really burgeoned with the discovery that you could differentiate both pigment epithelium and photoreceptors from uh, initially embryonic stem cells. Uh, and then subsequently, um, 
uh, through inducible progenitor stem cells. And of course, uh, the difference is that embryonic stem cells are, are derived from uh, products of conception. Uh, there was a, a very significant ethical overlay on the use of these cells all through the uh, 1990s and early 2000s. Um, and they were limited. Uh, you had certain cell lines that you could use. They weren't immunologically matched, et cetera. Um, more recently, since about 2007, it's become possible to make essentially the equivalent of embryonic stem cells using uh, the patient's own blood or epithelial cells uh, through the inducible progenitor stem cell route, where you use a, a series of uh, about four genes, which when transfected, de-differentiate the um, uh, blood cells or the uh, epithelial cells back into a stem cell-like uh, uh, state. Uh, several years ago, about a decade ago, several groups were uh, successful in taking those inducible progenitor stem cells and by providing them with appropriate protein cues at different times of development, uh, having them differentiate into essentially a um, retinal organoid or really an ocular organoid. And this, this was a, uh, a, a collection of cells in the dish that looks a lot like a developing retina. It has clear precursors of pigment epithelium, photoreceptors, uh, Mueller cells, ganglion cells, um, with the same relative uh, organization as you would see in an embryonic eye. Um, this has allowed uh, several groups to try to enrich for the different cell types uh, and transplant them. And uh, work is most advanced right now in the retinal pigment epithelium uh, because pigment epithelium is not a signaling neuron. It's, it's an, a supporting epithelium. The bar is a little lower. You don't have to, uh, in particular, make synapses with retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, and several groups, uh, particularly uh, uh, the Barty group at, at NEI, have succeeded in growing scaffolds of retinal pigment epithelium uh, on specific uh, bioscaffolding material, which results in a, a patch of RPE that can be transplanted uh, successfully. And that is through phase one uh, human clinical trials and looks very promising uh, that this is a, a viable means for replacing the pigment epithelium. Um, one of the challenges with that is that uh, uh, in order for that to be useful in a disease like macular degeneration, you have to transplant uh, before the photoreceptors die. And that's gonna create some challenges, I think, yeah. clinically in that uh, the surgery is quite invasive. You have to get underneath the retina and uh, inject and unscroll these, these uh, scaffolds of pigment epithelial cells. And uh, you probably don't wanna do that in a patient who's 20-20 uh, at baseline uh, because there's a fairly high uh, risk of some complication with that surgery. But on the other hand, if you wait till the patient has lost their vision, replacing their pigment epithelium is unlikely to restore uh, mm -hmm. their vision. So there's going to be a narrow window of applicability for that technique, at least in macular degeneration. Uh, several groups uh, have um, made significant progress in photoreceptor transplantation. Um, and uh, here again, this is largely uh, taking uh, uh, cells that look like photoreceptor precursors uh, and enriching for them out of retinal organoids and then uh, transplanting them. To my knowledge, no one has done a human uh, transplant yet with photoreceptor precursors, but people have transplanted human photoreceptor precursors into mouse degenerative models. And it's sort of a good news, bad news situation at this point, at least my, my uh, uh, understanding of the current literature, is that the cells um, take, that is, they, they uh, uh, survive. They go to the right part of the retina, that is, they take up the space between the pigment epithelium and the bipolar cells. The photoreceptors polarize appropriately. Photoreceptors have an outer segment and an inner segment, and that appears to to be uh, appropriate. Um, they seem to form something that looks like synapses with the bipolar cells, um, uh, at least uh, ultrastructurally. But the data that they're actually signaling visual information uh, downstream to the ganglion cells in a useful uh, manner is not as strong at this point. And I, I'm not, uh, I haven't seen data where native photoreceptors have been able to restore visual function uh, in an animal model of degeneration. Um, 
genetically modified photoreceptors have where, where extra photo uh, pigments or extra photoreceptor molecules are put in these precursors, that has been able to generate some vision-like responses. But uh, just for the native cells, of the, uh, at this point, I'm not aware that, that that has been successfully done. So I'd say promising, but not ready for prime time. Okay, and are there any, in in most regions of the, the central nervous system, or I know I wouldn't say in most, well, yeah, I guess most, there are some stem cells, some progenitor cells for some type of cell, whether it's oligodendrocyte progenitors making myelinating cells or in some brain regions, neural precursors. Are there stem cells in the retina that could be somehow uh, turned on and directed in? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, in lower, and I, I apologize for using the pejorative term lower, but uh, it's commonly used in lower uh, vertebrates uh, like uh, uh, fish and, and amphibians, the retina uh, is actually capable of uh, nearly complete regeneration. You can more or less pull the retina out of certain fish and certain right. amphibians and it will regrow completely, which suggests that you know evolutionarily in our line, uh, there at least was, uh, not that long ago in evolutionary terms, a uh, completely regenerative stem cell-based mechanism. Uh, that's uh, clearly somewhat dormant, at least in, in mammals. Uh, if you uh, injure a human retina, it does not regrow spontaneously. But several groups have studied those lower uh, vertebrate mechanisms and have isolated a... Uh, uh, a potency in a certain glial cell uh, called the Mueller glial cell. So Mueller glial cells uh, sit in the retina and they're the only cells that really span the whole retina. They, they have one foot on the inner limiting membrane of the, uh, uh, of the retina and the other foot goes all the way out to the uh, pigment epithelium. Uh, several groups, particularly Tom Ray's group uh, here at University of Washington, have been able to transdifferentiate those Mueller glial cells into precursors of other retinal cell types. So the idea that you could, for example, do gene therapy or have small molecules that would stimulate this uh, regenerative pathway, I think is a reasonable one. Um, that said, again, outside of uh, some limited experiments in mice showing that you can transdifferentiate these cells, uh, to date, no one's gotten to the point where in a human uh, uh, clinical setting, uh, there's anything in, uh, to my knowledge, in actual uh, clinical trials for doing retinal uh, regeneration out of Mueller glial cells. Uh, but the potential is there, and I think it's a very promising area of research right now. Early on, you mentioned that, well, some of your early work, you were finding that not only photoreceptors respond to light, but retinal ganglion cells, mm -hmm. my, that's my understanding. Is it, Can they be stimulated, but, but light won't induce an action potential in them, will it? Well, it will in a very small subset of retinal ganglion cells. So the retinal ganglion cells that uh, express the non-visual opsin melanopsin uh, are actually intrinsically photosensitive. That was discovered by David Burson uh, uh, now 20 years ago. Um, and uh, that's the mechanism by which light information is transmitted to the hypothalamus to entrain our circadian clocks, sure. drive sleep, wakefulness, yeah. alertness, and other functions. Um, a couple of groups have tried to co-opt that, uh, particularly Sachin Panda's group at Salk, by transgenically expressing melanopsin in a broader array of retinal ganglion cells. The, uh, the, the native melanopsin expressing cells only project really to the uh, hypothalamus. They don't, most of those cells don't go to the thalamus into the visual system. But he asked, well, what if you make those ganglion cells that normally project to the visual system light sensitive? And it sort of worked. I mean, he, he got action potentials in those cells. Um, they did seem to transmit uh, some information to the brain. But part of the problem uh, of that approach is that um, melanopsin is just not a good visual pigment. Its kinetics are very slow. So it, it takes kind of a second to ramp up and start firing. And then when you turn the lights off, it takes about five seconds to stop firing. Wow. And from a visual perspective, that really would induce... Uh, 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 just so much time motion blur that the, our, our visual system, which really evolved in concert with the rod and cone pigments to be a rapid, relatively rapid uh, 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 system, just probably wouldn't generate much useful information. 
Uh, that said, there have been three other uh, methods that um, various groups have undertaken to try to achieve that same end of um, what, what we call reanimating the uh, retinal ganglion cells in the absence of photoreceptors and making them light sensitive. So the, the first approach is a um, optoelectronic approach. And this involves uh, basically putting a an optoelectronic uh, prosthesis into the eye that uh, in some way either absorbs light itself or is connected to a video camera that, that can stimulate in a pattern. And then using external uh, currents to drive ganglion cell firing um, uh, directly, uh, basically extracellular stimulation of those cells to induce spiking. The first of these um, devices was, was developed uh, primarily at USC by uh, Mark Humayan and Gene Dewan, and I actually made it all the way to FDA orphan uh, device approval, and that was the Argus uh, uh, photo stimulator. Uh, the Argus II is the one that ended up going into several dozen people uh, around the world. It was a small 60, I think, electrode uh, array, something on that order, um, that was placed epiretinally over the center of the retina and then connected to a camera via a wire uh, that, that sat on the glasses, the patient's glasses, and it would capture an image and then send stimuli to those electrodes and try to stimulate ganglion cells. And it, it, it worked in principle in that people got a phosphine, they would see an image when, when projected. And if they were simple images like a giant letter X or O, they could distinguish those. And these were people who were profoundly blind. So it was extremely important in establishing the concept that if you reanimate the ganglion cells, you can generate useful information. The downside of the uh, Argus, there were several. One is that the resolution just was never going to be sufficient to, to restore what we would consider useful vision. Um, the second is that the 1990s technology that kind of drove that was, was problematic. Uh, uh, we didn't have wireless communication uh, at that point that was able to uh, communicate without a wire. And really leaving a wire going in and out of the eye is sort of a asking for uh, complications and infection. Um, and ultimately, uh, the company uh, uh, discontinued the device uh, several years ago. Um, uh, and um, the, that company, Second Sight, uh, has moved on more towards doing cortical stimulation, which we can talk about at the end. Um, but uh, uh, several other uh, groups have sort of come into that space recently. And I think the most prominent, at least that I'm aware of, is the Pix Pixium uh, company. I should say, by the way, I have no financial stake in any of the things we're talking about today. I, I have absolutely zero financial stake in any of this. Um, but Pixium uh, is a French company, uh, and in collaboration with Daniel Polanker's lab at Stanford, uh, along with uh, uh, Jose Sahal and his group uh, in both Paris and, and Pittsburgh, have made a much higher density electrode device that's implanted subretinally as opposed to epiretinally is stimulated directly by infrared light, which is interesting. So you can control sort of what the stimulus is by staying in the infrared uh, 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 wavelengths. Um, and it uh, is able to stimulate ganglion cells at much closer to single cell level resolution. And so that device has been implanted and uh, tested in, in phase one uh, trials and does seem to uh, restore uh, some useful vision for individuals uh, with central retinal degeneration. Now, the, the challenge to this device is that um, the size of a wafer that you can surgically implant underneath the retina is pretty limited. And I don't think this is ever going to work for more than about the central five degrees of vision. You just physically can't get a wafer big enough to cover more of the retina uh, uh, in a retinal surgery. You actually have to cut the retina, do a retinotomy in order to implant the device, which is a pretty invasive surgery. So I think it but will be would, limited. Will the patients be be able to navigate in their house or, you know? Uh, yeah, that's it, about the level of vision that they're expecting. The The challenge again with the Pixium, and I, I don't want to uh, minimize its, its potential because I think it is potentially very useful, is that for patients who have lost visual field, um, replacing the center part of their field at five degrees in the US, a five or even 10 degree central visual field is still considered legally blind. 
because you have no peripheral vision. So I see these optoelectric devices as really being useful for people specifically with relatively severe but constrained macular degeneration where they've lost the dead center of their vision mm -hmm. uh, from geographic atrophy or other, other dry forms of macular degeneration. And you could potentially replace uh, the, uh, that central portion of vision. So that's one approach to uh, making ganglion cells directly photosensitive is to stimulate them electronically. A second approach uh, is to uh, genetically confer on the ganglion cells or their immediate upstream bipolar cells photosensitivity via gene therapy. Yeah. And there have been uh, two different approaches to this. One is um, use of directly photo, uh, directly ion channel gated opsins. So um, microbial opsins, unlike our mammalian opsins, um, I should back up, our mammalian opsins are G protein coupled receptors. So they uh, are seven transmembrane uh, spanning proteins that bind retinaldehyde as their chromophore. And when the retinaldehyde is isomerized by light, that stimulates a, a, a G, uh, a G protein, a coupling protein, to uh, start a signaling cascade. Um, and uh, all of our opsins uh, in mammals work that way. If you go way back in evolution to things like uh, photosynthetic algae and, and uh, organisms like Chlamydomonas and uh, halobacteria, they also have seven transmembrane opsins, but instead of being G protein coupled, they're actually directly coupled to either uh, uh, cation or anion channels, that is uh, uh, positive or negative conducting channels. And uh, several groups starting again about 25 years ago now um, uh, with PAN's very uh, groundbreaking work um, have used this as sort of optogenetic approach to make ganglion cells fire directly uh, in response to light. And several groups now have gotten into stage one, phase one human clinical trials with directly uh, photosensitive uh, halo opsins or, or uh, channel opsins. Um, and the results are promising. Uh, I think they are actually seeing human um, responses to light, uh, uh, some visual function restored in mm -hmm. profoundly blind patients who, who get these uh, therapies. There now are they, some they using viral, are they using AAV as well? Yeah, these are AAV, and typically uh, they're trying to do this via intravitreal AAV, which is a little more challenging than subretinal to get widespread um, cell transduction. Uh, it turns out that the something about the inner limiting membrane of uh, humans makes it hard for adeno-associated viruses mm -hmm. to to infect, uh, and so that's been a challenge with all of the AAV intravitreal methods is getting enough cells transduced. But I think a lot of progress has been made on that uh, front, particularly using uh, directed evolution of AAV capsids and work that John Flannery and others have done. Um, so there are, as I said, several human clinical trials uh, underway right now for channel opsins. Uh, I think the, the two challenges with the channel opsin work, three challenges really, one is um, they are foreign proteins, and uh, there is a theoretical and practical risk that if you uh, highly express a chlamydomonas uh, protein in your retina, even though the retina is a relatively uh, immune privileged site, you can wind up with um, significant long term inflammation, which can cause damage. And several gene therapy trials for a variety of gene replacements have been held up because of inflammation that's occurred with the, with the gene therapy trial. So that, that's a challenge. The second, and I think bigger challenge with the channel opsin work is that there's really no signal amplification that occurs with the, uh, with this technique. So, um, one opsin is one channel, uh, as opposed to in, um, uh, human opsins, uh, because of the signal transduction cascade that's triggered one retinaldehyde isomerization will trigger multiple G protein stimulation, which will trigger multiple phosphodiesterase stimulation, which will end up closing uh, many, many uh, cyclic nucleotide gated channels. And so you get this massive signal amplification, which allows us to see single photon level uh, sensitivity. You simply don't get that with the channel opsin. So they're gonna be limited in terms of low light uh, exposure. Uh, and of course, they're spectrally limited as well, which is true of all, all uh, uh, single options.
nonetheless, very promising approach. And again, uh, in human clinical trials. The second approach that uh, has been taken is work that really came from uh, John Flannery and Udi Isikoff um, and, and their groups at UC Berkeley. And this was an experiment that I have to say, if I had been the thesis advisor, uh, I probably would have dissuaded my student from trying it. Um, it was to put uh, human rhodopsin and human conopsins into AAV vectors and then direct them to ganglion cells or bipolar cells. Uh, canonical uh, pharmacology would say that in the absence of the G protein for the opsins, which are the transducins, uh, there, there's a rod transducin and a cone transducin. Um, one would have thought that expressing a human opsin in a ganglion cell would result in no signal because there's no transducin in the ganglion cells. But it turns out that these GP, these opsins are pretty promiscuous GPCRs, and if they don't have transducin, they will find another G protein to stimulate and, and uh, signal through. And remarkably, in animal studies, uh, the gene therapy um, uh, approach uh, of putting either rod or even better cone uh, opsin into either bipolar cells or uh, retinal ganglion cells with AAV-mediated transduction and the appropriate uh, cell type-specific promoter actually resulted in pretty decent uh, light stimulation of ganglion cell function and in mice, pretty decent restoration of something that looks like visual function, at least in terms of uh, uh, two, two choice uh, uh, assays and, and forced learning uh, paradigms. That work um, is licensed out uh, and uh, uh, I believe Novartis uh, licensed that work from a company called Videre, which ha had the intellectual property from Berkeley. Um, I have to say since that licensing happened, which was in 2019, I believe, or early 2020, it's been radio silence. Uh, I'm not aware of there being in a human clinical trial at this point. Uh, and I don't see anything on clinicaltrials.gov that says that they're enrolling. Huh. So I'm not sure where that work sits right now. Uh, but in my view, that's the most promising of the gene therapy approaches to vision restoration. And could you, could before we finish up and talk about, you know, directly stimulating the visual cortex, uh, small molecular photo switches. Yeah. So thank you. That's actually the area that my own lab has been interested in. And uh, this... Um, work also comes about from uh, basic neuroscientists at, at UC Berkeley and a very, very talented uh, synthetic organic chemist, Dirk Trauner, who was at Berkeley at that time and is now at University of Pennsylvania, along with Rich Kramer, who's a professor of uh, uh, molecular and cell biology at UC Berkeley. Um, and what uh, Dirk and, and Rich started working on again in the uh, early 2000s, um, so 20 years ago, was um, putting a light switch on small molecules. Uh, azobenzene is a food dye, actually. We've all eaten pounds of azobenzene, very safe uh, uh, compound that's made up of two benzene rings with a nitrogen double bond connecting them. And this, like the uh, vitamin A derivatives, um, is a photoisomerizable double bond, meaning that when uh, certain wavelengths of light hit this double bond, it can shift from the benzenes being on the same side of the double bond, which we would call cis conformation, to trans conformation, where, where they're on opposite sides of the double bond. Um, and uh, what Dirk Trauner realized is that uh, that isomerization changes the steric chemistry of whatever you attach one of these things to. And if you're lucky, um, you can find a situation where your steric chemistry is un unaffected by one form, either cis or trans, and uh, is then uh, basically the compound is disabled in the other conformation. And the example that they started working on with this uh, 20 plus years ago was voltage-gated potassium channel blockers. Uh, voltage-gated potassium channels are uh, found in every neuron, uh, they're found in most cells actually, but uh, particularly in neurons. And they are responsible for the repolarization of neurons after they fire. So when, when uh, neurotransmitters cause depolarization of a, a cell, you get to a threshold uh, a potential which opens up voltage-gated sodium channels, yeah. that causes a huge depolarization in, in the cell. Uh, 
Um, once those channels close, in order for the cell to repolarize back to a negative holding potential, potassium has to flow out of the cell. Um, and that uh, is mediated by these voltage-gated potassium channels. So if you block them, what happens is the cell stays in a depolarized state and it will fire repeatedly. Um, the uh, pharmacology of those uh, voltage-gated potassium channels has been known for a long time. And tetraethyl ammonium, or TEA, uh, is, has been around for, I don't know, 70 years, something like that, as, as a chemical that blocks uh, voltage-gated potassium channels. So uh, Dirk put a, an azobenzene moiety on a quaternary ammonium, on tetraethyl ammonium. Um, and amazingly, that uh, conferred light sensitivity on the, on the potassium channel blockade. So if you turn the lights on, uh, it goes into the um, blocked conformation and you get repetitive cell firing. Uh, and if you turn the cells off, then the channel opens and it's business as usual and the cells uh, hyperpolarize again. So what this does is it allows one to uh, use a small molecule to basically confer light sensitivity on retinal ganglion cells just by bathing them in this, in this compound. Uh, I was at a FASEB meeting in 2006 um, in Southern California, miserable meeting because it was uh, in June in, in Palm Desert. Uh, you know, uh, the difference between clinical meetings and basic science meetings is a clinical meeting will be in January in Palm Desert. And, uh, <laughs> the, the basic science meeting will be in June in Palm Desert. Uh, and we were really uh, kind of trapped inside because it was over 110 degrees out and it was actually monsoon season. So it was raining. And uh, I ended up uh, just just uh, sitting next to uh, Rich Kramer right after he had presented some of this work uh, where they were doing hippocampal slices with the, the photo switches. And I asked him, you know, have you done retinas yet? And he said, yeah, we've done a few retinas, but it's hard for us to figure out what's going on on a cell by cell basis. And I said, you know, we've been doing multi electrode array recordings for, for years now for our melanopsin work. This would be perfect. We could just put a blind retina on, you know, soak it in some, uh, some photo switch compound and just see what happens at the level of the whole retina. And he said, great, let's collaborate. So we started a collaboration in 2007 on that. And it's uh, now, 17 years later almost, and uh, we're still collaborating, which is which is really fun. Um, but over those years, we have gotten uh, two additional generations of these compounds through animals. They definitely restore uh, vision-like function to blind mice with retinal degeneration. And very happy to report that uh, this past year, uh, the, the IP on this was uh, acquired by a company called Kiora, and the first six uh, subjects uh, were tested with intravitreal uh, uh, small molecule photo switch, uh, which is now uh, uh, KIO301, uh, which we called BNAC. Um, and in all of the subjects, it uh, conferred um, improved visual function to people with very profound level of blindness from retinitis pigmentosa, including taking uh, one subject from no light perception to clearly being able to, to uh, perceive light and shapes and for people with uh, uh, hand motion vision, getting them to near counting fingers vision, which is an improvement. Um, so uh, it's an exciting approach and it has some advantages over gene therapy in that uh, it's um, an easier regulatory path. We don't have worries yeah. about inflammation uh, and it's upgradable as the drugs get better over time. That, that That's really exciting. Are, is there any way to tweak it so that you can kind of enhance the what's accomplished in terms of the patient's resolution? Yeah, great question, Mark. And that's actually where my lab has been focusing its efforts for the last couple of years. Um, the code that comes out of the ganglion cells is non-native. Uh, retinal ganglion cells, there's about 30 different kinds of ganglion cells in a human. They all have different encodings. Some of them uh, mm -hmm. uh, fire when the lights go on, some when fire when the lights go off, some are directional and they fire when light is moving a certain way across the retina, some are contrast-based. Yeah. Um, and with all of these techniques, whether it's the uh, optoelectronics or gene therapy or small molecule, you're basically taking all of those different patterns and saying one size fits all, you're all gonna be square wave on off cells. And the brain really is not ready for that. The brain is used to decoding a very complex mix of ganglion cell uh, 
input. And when you replace that code with a very simple code, you end up with degraded image. Uh, and I think that's why we're not seeing, you know, miraculous improvement yeah. in vision. Um, that turns out to be a math problem. And uh, it is solvable. It's hard to solve, but it's solvable in that there's a couple of transforms that if you understand them, you could uh, basically recreate the firing pattern that you're looking for. So in simple terms, if I had an image that I project on a retina, and I know that that image is going to produce a certain set of patterns of cell firing, some cells firing very strongly, some cells suppressed to a particular image. <clears throat> and then I put the same image onto a, let's say a photo switch treated retina. And now every cell is gonna fire in sort of the square wave, uh, depending on the intensity that the, of the light over it. Um, what I need to do is actually uh, go back and say, okay, if the goal is to have the retina fire in the, the native pattern, um, and I now know that I can make all these cells sort of fire or not fire based on just intensity, what I need to do is go back to my original image and transform it so that it's flashing in a certain way that makes each of those neurons behave as if it were seeing the original image. Um, and it turns out that this is a, a tractable but difficult problem. Uh, and we've enlisted some uh, fairly sophisticated artificial intelligence techniques now to try to uh, use machine learning to predict what the cell firing patterns are to a given uh, stimulus and then predict what stimulus should uh, emulate that. And we, we have a grant uh, going in right now to try to do that with the, the photo switch uh, molecules in um, in vitro for mouse retinas. So I think if we can get, and I would uh, uh, picture this as an assistive device. It would be like the Geordi LaForge glasses from Star Trek TNG, uh, where you'd have a little camera that would look at the outside world and then reinterpret that in a, uh, a projected image that to you and me would look like nonsense, but to our retinal, uh, to our uh, photo switch stimulated retinal ganglion cells would emulate what our normal ganglion cells see. So that's really the next frontier, I think, in this vision restoration work is to, to use a hybrid of computer vision and these uh, assistive technologies to try to recreate more useful vision for people. And so, so moving to the visual cortex, I, I guess the general idea is what you just said or previously, you have to be able to reproduce some pattern of activity in in cells in the visual cortex that receive, well, there's one relay right in the lateral geniculate nucleus, but then, yeah, that's exactly right. So the the idea here is that um, there's a, a some sort of a mapping, um, high dimensional mapping between a three dimensional scene that you see out in the real world, and a four dimensional firing pattern that happens in your cortex. Um, and I say four-dimensional because unlike the retina, which we can treat as a two-dimensional surface, the ganglion cells essentially are in one dimension or in two dimensions. There's no real depth to ganglion cells. Uh, when we get into the cortex, we are dealing with a three-dimensional tissue because there's multiple cortical layers and they each have different processing neurons, um, which is one of the challenges of doing cortical stimulation is that you really have to get to the right layers and stimulate them appropriately. But, but um, before you get to that, what, what about stimulating in the lateral geniculate nucleus. Are those cell, Are those neurons still alive in, in they are. Um, glaucoma? You could technically do that. Um, the mapping of the, it's interesting, the, the uh, spatial mapping of visual information in the retina is extremely straightforward. You know, yeah. if I look in someone's retina, I know exactly what part of their visual field I'm looking in. And the cortex, it's relatively straightforward. We have, you know, the famous homunculus, uh -huh. which uh, essentially, uh, uh, you know, for the somatosensory cortex shows you where your sensory neurons are mapped. There's a visual mapping as well. And so we know that certain parts of the occipital cortex map to certain parts of space, uh, not proportionally. The center of your vision, for example, takes up a huge area right in the back of your occipital cortex, periphery less. The thalamus is not so cleanly mapped. So it, it uh, there's a lot of um, a sort of uh, dispersion and then reintegration of information, spatial and uh, information in particular uh, 
that happens at the layer of the thalamus. And you have these multiple thalamic layers that have redundant information in them that get sort of rewired back together again when you when you get to the occipital cortex. So I think the problem of, of restoring vision from thalamic stimulation is going to be more difficult than, than cortical. It's also neurosurgically more challenging to get uh, you know an implant into someone's thalamus as opposed to uh, right up on their visual cortex, which is more accessible. Yeah. Okay, and then is this some? So what? How, how many different groups are working on this, stimulating the vision? Is Elon Musk working on that with his? I don't know if they're doing direct work in in that way. There's, uh, I think, the uh, advent of machine learning uh, and the you know amazing advances in AI in the last um, decade or really half decade. Uh, have really provided some impetus to people working on these sort of brain, um, sensory brain interface uh, problems. And there was a major milestone quite recently in the past few weeks where a, a group, I think a Japanese group, um, was able to essentially use AI to decode uh, uh, ensemble cortical activity as measured by electroencephalogram and uh, put percepts back together based on that. That is, if you were to you know, imagine a particular scene or look at a particular scene that the EEG could be decoded by a, a, a trained AI system to at least give a, a reasonably good guess as to what you were looking at or thinking of. Um, and I think uh, people are looking at this as now doing this in reverse engineering, where if you knew that pattern, again, if you had an AI that was trained, you could theoretically stimulate the cortex, uh, kind of like the matrix style, um, and create a virtual reality, which could be very useful for people with profound levels of blindness. Uh, I would say at this point in 2023, almost 2024, still on the border of science fiction to be able to do that. Um, but I don't think that it's a crazy idea. I, I think that that uh, it, it, if 10 years from now, we actually had a device that was reduced to that, I wouldn't be shocked because um, uh, I think it's achievable. But to this point, no one has quite achieved it yet. Okay, so this is exciting. So there's been major advances, uh, you know, in this field in terms of going from preclinical work to the clinic with some success, you know, in various approaches and the technologies are moving quickly. Uh, what about, uh, yeah, I, that's an ethical thing. And, so are the, is uh, retinitis pigmentosum, is that recessively inherited or dominant? There's uh, different flavors of it. Uh, some mm -hmm. are dominant, some are X-linked, and some are, are recessive. Um, there is uh, significant work right now happening for the dominant forms, particularly uh, in doing gene editing therapy uh, to try to um, oh. edit out the, the dominant forms. Um, uh, that also applies to recessive, but it's a little easier to imagine for dominant uh, forms. Um, and those are very promising. The challenge is, again, there's over 100 genes and over, over 300 mutations. Um, and you, you really have to have a bespoke edit for each one. Uh, and, you know, the FDA hasn't quite uh, come to terms yet with how one regulates that, where each, you know, where you have a, a class of therapies, but your guide RNAs are different from each one. Do you give a blanket approval and then say you have uh, you know, you can use different guide RNAs for this, or is it a, uh, uh, each one needs to be approved for that particular flavor of RP or something in between. Um, but I, I do anticipate that we will be seeing introduction of gene editing for uh, retinitis pigmentosa in the clinic in the next decade. I'd be surprised if that does not make it to clinical uh, use by, by 10 years from now. Yeah. Well, great. <laughs> You did a great job uh, going over this stuff and, uh, you know, a lot of information, very clear. I was going to ask you what, one final question. Uh, are you going to watch a football game Monday? Of course. This is, uh, you know, it, uh, statistically, uh, it's it's a rare opportunity for your, uh, your team to play for a national championship. And uh, uh, it's happened once before in my life that my team played for a national championship. And that was when uh, the Huskies got... Uh, 
unceremoniously uh, spun out of the first round of the CFP in 2016. So yeah, I, I will take advantage of the opportunity to watch the Huskies play the Longhorns. Uh, that that the seems like they got a great chance. So yeah, it's exciting. I, you know, this is their year. They're undefeated. They have a great quarterback. Uh, they have a phenomenal coach. So uh, yeah, would, that would that be a good start to 24 if we... Uh, uh, if I, we can bring a national championship back to Seattle. I have I have relatives in in Seattle and uh, they're big uh, UW fans and uh, well Seahawk fans too. Yeah, Seahawks are not going to. Uh, if the Seahawks make yeah. the uh, Super Bowl this year, I'll be pretty stunned. Uh, I, I don't think I don't see that coming. But no. uh, but at least the Huskies have a have a fighting chance. Uh, and where are you based, Mark? Where where's home for you? By Baltimore. So. Yeah, the Ravens are doing good this year. So they are. They have a good team. My wife is from Baltimore, so we we uh, oh, were there yeah. fairly fairly often. We uh, in fact, I'll be back out in January for a for a quick visit. Okay, great. Well, thanks a lot for taking the time, Russ. I really appreciate it. You bet, Mark. If there's anything that needs clarification or editing or whatever as you go through it, uh, just let me know. Happy to re re uh, uh, do any parts that that got mangled. But uh, otherwise, really appreciate the opportunity opportunity to talk about this stuff. Yeah. Happy New Year. Likewise. Take care. Bye.